River family, welcome to uh, church again, church online again. And I want to start off by saying something that's kind of a, a secretive. I cannot confirm or deny the existence of the PPP. I, I just I got to leave that out there. I just can't confirm or deny the existence of that. If you don't know what that is, you can ask somebody when we get back together soon. And let's talk about that for a minute. There's a possibility, we don't know yet, we're not going to make our decision until after the 18th, but there's a possibility that we will attempt to have in-person worship on May the 24th at our regular time. Uh, however, stay tuned. We're watching numbers. We're, we're, we're waiting for the governor to give us kind of a stronger go-ahead, but that is a possibility. Also on May 24th, our women of faith may actually get uh, together as well. Um, and the women with purpose, excuse me, that's what they're called, women with a purpose. And then uh, they also may end up doing uh, something via Zoom if they're not able to gather in person. So I want to encourage you to stay tuned to see all the things that might be going on uh, with that. Also, don't forget, in this time, uh, we as a church have a wonderful opportunity when we start to get back together to reach people. To reach people that maybe, uh, because of what's going on with the COVID-19, may be asking some, some serious questions. So I want to encourage you to participate in that ministry. And one of the best ways to participate in that ministry is through giving. And the first way that you can give is you can send a check to 539 U.S. 83, Abilene, Texas, 79602. Uh, and we can receive your, your uh, um, offering or tithe at that point. Also, you can go and text. Uh, you see, the text number is 84321, 84321. And if you text that, there's a secure way to be able to give online. And then, as always, you can give uh, online through our uh, website, which is theriverabilene.com. We'd love for you to be able to give to participate in what we believe is coming, and that is a great move of, of God in this place called the River Abilene. So I want to encourage you to do that. God bless you. Let's worship for a while. Lord, we come before you, declaring your goodness and your awesomeness. We just say, have your way in us today. In Jesus' name. There's a grace when the heart is undefined.
direct access to you. Thank you that you love us so much. God, we praise you this morning.
is well. It is well with me. Can you say that this morning? Wherever you are, make that your declaration today. It is well. It is well. Say that with your mouth. Declare that this morning. It is well with me. Say it by faith, even if you don't feel it. It is well. The situation with my children, it is well. The circumstances in my finances, it is well. Come on, whatever it is that you're going through today, whatever battles you are facing, whatever struggles you're going through, I want you to declare right now, it is well. It is well with you. It is well with your soul. It is well with your spirit. Do not be disheartened. It is well. family. Pastor David here. Uh, so glad you joined me again for this Sunday's Crosstalk. We've been uh, using the concept of what we can learn post-resurrection about the power of what Christ did on the way to and from the cross. Uh, a lot of people will call that atonement theories. There's a lot of different ways, redemption theories, a lot of ways to look at that. But here's what I want you to know is I had trouble sleeping last night. And I felt like there was great um, attack against me to not share this message today. So I want to encourage you to listen to this one. It's short, but it's stuff that I really, really think that we need to know. So I brought a really interesting cross today. I don't know if you can see that. It's, um, I think it's called a, a gripping cross or a prayer cross or a stress cross. You can, you can kind of wrap your, your hands around it. It was given to me by someone who was under a lot of suffering, who's gone through lots of issues in their life, and yet sort of faced that in this amazing, brave, um, and trusting way with the Lord. Um, we're going to learn a little bit more of that today, but what I find is this cross reminds me of her and just her strength, even though she was going through such a difficult, and, and a difficult time and really a, a long time of suffering. So let's talk about everybody's favorite subjects, pain and suffering. Let's talk about those for a little bit. I know that's what everybody wants to talk about. There was this man, 
went in and he ended up having this very, very long, very expensive surgery. And, and the results were going to be in great question. And he comes out of the surgery and a, and a week or two later, he comes in to visit with his, his, his doctor post-op. And he says, Doc, hey, um, you know, what's going on with it and everything? The doctor said, well, I've got some sad news. I can only give you six months to live. The guy said, wow, I just can't, I can't believe that. That's, that's terrible news. You know, that surgery was so expensive, it's going to take me at least a year to even just pay you off. And the doctor says, well, then I give you a year to live. A lot of us face pain and suffering, but it's not frivolous, is it? What if I told you what you go through can have meaning and that the process of healing is intrinsic to the cross. Let's pray. We're going to be in 1 Peter. It's toward the end of your Bible. It's between Hebrews and Revelation. If you hit Hebrews, take a right. If you hit uh, Revelation, take a left. So I want to encourage you to do that. So let's pray real quickly and we'll dive into this. Lord, I want to thank you once again for the fact that we can talk and deal with this amazing amazing sacrifice, your death, your resurrection, your redemption, your atonement, all that you did for us on your way to and on the cross and then walking out of the tomb. So Lord, I I pray now that as we see the expansiveness of getting to follow our God, getting to follow our Savior, that we would learn a higher sense of submissiveness and also see a bigger sense of what you do to bring healing. So Lord, I pray for me that I would decrease and that you would increase and be our preacher and teacher today. All the people said, amen. Now say that to somebody next to you and say, wake up, this is important, okay? So I'm going to read the first three verses. We're going to be in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21. Now, let me tell you how this was written, the context in which this was written. Uh, Both the books of of Peter were written by Peter, shocking, right? Written by Peter to a predominantly Gentile audience. Now, what that means is these people were not God-fearers. These were people that were not necessarily of any Jewish origin. They lived a life, the Roman life. Let me say it this way. The Roman life, the Roman lifestyle was something worse than Vegas, okay? So the way that the Romans lived made... Made, 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 made Las Vegas seem pretty tame. I mean, and it was their normal mode of life. Well, what happens is, is you have all these people who are beginning to meet Jesus, and they begin to decide that they don't want to, adults, stick with me here, that they don't want to attend those big parties of multiple intimacies. Are you following me, older people? They're determining that they no longer want to worship cultic gods. They've decided that Rome is not God and the emperor is not God, but that Jesus is the one and true God. And they're living this sacrificial, loving, transformative life inside. And guess what's happening? Their friends and family members are beginning to reject them. And as a matter of fact, they will turn them in for what they're doing So that they can eventually acquire their land. And a great persecution eventually comes. So Peter's writing to this group that is under enormous suffering and pressure. Many of these folks are actually in slavery and are being treated even worse because of their newfound faith in Jesus Christ. And he's saying, I've got some advice for you as you walk through this difficult stage of life this difficult stage of following Jesus. Starting in 1 Peter chapter 2, starting in verse 21, to this you were called because Christ suffered for you. Say, he suffered for me. Say that to somebody right now. Christ suffered for you, leaving you an example. Everybody say example, big word. He suffered for me, gave me an example that you should follow in his steps. Look, he requotes uh, the Old Testament. He committed no sin. No deceit was found in his mouth. There's the example. When they hurled their insults at him, he did not retaliate. When he suffered, he made no threats. Now watch this. 
Instead, he entrusted himself to him who judges justly. He entrusted himself. So he said, in this mode of suffering that you're going on, you have, you have an example in Christ. And that example is, how did Jesus walk to the cross? How did Jesus face the cross? How did Jesus face his death? How did Jesus face all this suffering and still come through it victoriously and with a kingdom purpose? I'm going to give you just two things today. It's going to be so simple. Two things. Number one, if you have breath in your body, And you are either living for Jesus or living in a fallen, sinful world, world, you will suffer. You're probably saying, Pastor David, I I wanted you to tell me how cool I was. No, we're going to suffer. People are not going to congratulate us for really being sold out to Jesus. And we live in a sinful, fallen world in which people hurt, get hurt, justly and unjustly. Peter's telling them, whether it's just or unjust, you have an example for how you can walk through suffering, just like Jesus walked through suffering on the cross. And he says this, you must entrust yourself to the Father. So I don't know about you, whenever I face suffering, it's like the last thing I think about. It's not my first go-to thing whenever I'm really, really suffering. I don't go, oh, I trust you, Jesus. It's all good. That's not my go-to thing. Entrusting ourselves is, here's the example. Jesus in the garden saying, not my will, but yours be done. That's trust. Holding his tongue under trial, that's trust. Whenever he looks up into heaven at the end of of his life on earth as a human, he says, into your hands I commit my spirit. It is that amazing, difficult, but powerful sense of full-on trust that gives, listen, that gives suffering meaning. Let me say it again. That gives suffering meaning meaning. If you face this suffering knowing that you have an example and that you can trust the Father just like Jesus trusted the Father, your suffering will not just be random and awful. It will have meaning. Kingdom meaning. Here's an example. You you know uh, Ted Turner. Ted Turner um, started CNN and TBS and TNT and all these stations. He was kind of a big media mogul. He really made news when he gave a billion dollars away uh, to, to uh, um, one organization to help kids out. He, he was a very, very wealthy man. He said this. He said Christianity is a religion for losers. Now, where did he come from? He must have come from a, a difficult, maybe atheistic culture. Not at all. He was raised to follow Jesus. He, at one point, considered going on to the mission field. But but guess what? At one point, this is how he viewed suffering. At one point, he looked at suffering in the world and couldn't reconcile how an all-powerful God would allow suffering. And he left the faith. And he went from almost going to the mission field to calling Christians Losers. That's the wrong perspective on suffering. Now, contrast that with with Billy Graham. He was interviewed about the onset of Parkinson's that he had. And he, he was asked about how he was dealing with it and everything. And he said, you know, I think that God sent this to me at this age so that I would realize that I'm fully dependent on him. You see, Billy Graham knew his suffering had purpose. Ted Turner saw no purpose. Are, are, you, are you going through something right now? Does it feel empty? Does it feel all-consuming? 
as if there's no victory attached? Peter says this, you have an example in Christ. Walk through it with amazing trust. And even if it doesn't make sense now, it will have meaning. Beloved, the cross gives us the access to be able to have meaning in our suffering. There's the first thing. There's the first thing. He goes on to give us another picture where he requotes Isaiah um, uh, 53, 5. He says this, He himself bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, everybody say wounds, stripes, there's a lot of different ways to do this, by his scourging, by his wounds you have been healed. And everybody say healed. For you were like sheep gone astray, but now you have returned to the shepherd and the overseer of our souls. You have gone astray, but now that you've returned to the overseer of your soul. So consider this. First of all, if we follow Christ's example in our suffering, it has meaning, usefulness. We grow. Somebody sees our witness. There's something, there's something that we learn. There's something powerful, eternal about what God does in our life when we go through suffering with the same kind of trust that Jesus had from the cross when he said, into your hands I commit my spirit. And then secondly, it says when we are returning, we've been lost, we've been wandering around, but whenever we claim what Jesus did on the cross and we connect in that relationship, here's what happens. It says, by his wounds, by his stripes, we are healed. Now, they knew exactly what this was when they read it. By his stripes. It's the Greek word that literally means whelps that are raised and bleeding caused by a blow. You see, in their minds, they saw someone being scourged and bleeding in this awful, horrible manner. Which, how in the world can you look at that and say, I'm accessing healing from this? That's the economy of the cross. And they say, because Jesus did that, you now have the possibility of being healed. I don't know if you've ever seen Mel Gibson's uh, The Passion of the Christ, but I will never forget watching the scourging scene for the very first time. And in my mind, I just wanted to yell out, that's enough. But every time it happened, it was a reminder that that gives me the opportunity to be healed. Therapao, healing. So let's talk about healing. So first we know we can have meaning in our suffering. Secondly, we know that we can be healed because of what Jesus did on the way to the cross. So let's talk about healing. You know what we love? We love the big Miracle stories. And they're awesome. And God's in the business. But whenever it talks about therapao, it's, there's three different pictures. The first picture is when something has been uh, doctored up medicinally. So the first picture of this would be uh, if somebody got hurt and there is, there's some medicine and a Band-Aid. It's sort of uh, taking care of it. I, I will never forget, I got bit by a, I've been bit by lots of things, lots and lots of things in Texas. Uh, but anyway, I was bit by a spider. And the bite, I was having an allergic reaction to the bite. And every day I just got a little worse and I kind of swelled up. Like, I don't know if you've ever seen that movie Hitch with Will Smith. Whenever he has that reaction, that's what I felt like. I felt like my lips were huge and all this stuff. And I was having hives and everything. And I remember, I remember going into the doctor. And of course, the doctor's like, oh, allergic reaction. So he gives me a steroid. It was strange. The steroid came into my body and it felt like somebody was pouring ice water into my veins it just kind of cooled things off you know what i wasn't fully healed yet but that's a picture of therapato healing is salve on the wound 
The second picture of healing is this, is a wound being closed up. So in our world, we'd be thinking about, you know, stitches, or uh, there's some really cool super glue type stuff that they use now. And it's bringing that wound together and then sealing it off with stitches or with that super glue. I know medical people, that's not the official terminology, but it's like super glue. And you put it together and that it's not fixed. It's not healed. It's begun the process. You see, the first two pictures of therapy or healing are actually uh, the beginning of the process. They're not the completing of the process. And then the last one is a complete instantaneous healing, whether that be heart, mind, soul, or body, instantaneous healing. I've seen, I'll never forget my, uh, I had an aunt uh, that was in her 80s, and she was down with a really, really bad gallbladder attack. She'd been in bed for three, four days. And so my mama said, well, let's go over. We're going we're gonna to pray for her. And we went over and we prayed for her. And uh, she's still laying in bed, but all of us, the whole family prayed for her. And we got in the car and we drove back home. The, the trip home was about four hours. When we walked into the house, the phone was ringing. It was my aunt. And she said this, she said, about an hour after y'all left, all the pain ceased. I felt amazing. I got up and ate and I started doing stuff. You see, God's still in that business. But it happened because of Jesus going to the cross. So sometimes what it means to be healed is that the process is begun, the salve is on, the, the stitches are in, or there's a supernatural healing. But whatever way you see it, it is started and will be completed. Because by His stripes, we are healed. We are fully healed when we are fully engaged, heart, soul, mind, and strength into the business of the kingdom in some harmonious way, whether we are disease-free or not. That's the business of what Jesus can do through his stripes or his scourging or the whelps that came on his back. Two things. Is your suffering meaningless? Then I want to encourage you to retool to look at it a different way. Look at the cross and remember that there was a Savior that in the midst of not fully being aware, feeling what it feels like to be human and not understanding what's next, that He said, into your hands, talking to the Father, I commend my spirit. That when we trust in that manner, suffering has meaning. Kingdom. And then secondly, because of what we see that he did on the way to the cross, the scourging, this awful scourging that was only 39 lashes because no man could survive 40, that each time he took that, that gave us an opportunity now to begin the healing process. And beloved, I know in my spirit, some of you need healing. I know in my spirit, some of you are suffering. And I know in my spirit that when you look in the cross, you may just see a symbol instead of the Savior behind the symbol. A Savior that can bring meaning to your suffering. And a Savior who took a scourging so that you could be healed. So if you're hurting today, beloved, if you're suffering today, I want to give you the good news. Jesus has opened the door to make meaning out of your suffering. And then you can come to the end of it and you will realize that the Lord used whatever you had to go through for his kingdom if you trust him like Jesus did from the cross. And then secondly, whatever's ailing you, it may be a heartache. It could be 
an addiction. It could be a mental picture. It could be something in your past. It could be something physical. It could be spiritual damage. That in light of what Jesus did in his scourging and the stripes that he took, you now can be healed. The salve, the connection, and the completion. So here's what I want to encourage you. The Lord wants you to know as we do this cross talk, and just like the person who gave this to me was facing suffering, physical, mental, and emotional. She knew if she held on to this, there was a possibility that that had meaning. And there was a possibility that she could be healed. So I know you're at home. Maybe you don't feel like church. <laughs> Maybe you're in bed. Maybe you're sitting on the couch. Uh, at the breakfast table, wherever you are, stop. Stop for a minute. Don't think about what else you need to get done. Just let the Lord deal with you. And guess what? Once you deal with the Lord, let me pray for you. Lord, I'm just so challenged by the fact in a culture where we just hate the idea of suffering that we see a whole group of people that were suffering. Suffering for loving you, suffering for living in a sinful, fallen world. And yet, this apostle gives them the secret to finding meaning in their suffering. So Lord, I want to lift up that person right now that, that just can't make sense of what they're going through. They just don't get it. I pray now that just like in the garden you said, your will be done, not mine. And just like from the cross you said, into, my, into your, your hands I commit my spirit. That that kind of awe-inspiring trust would happen. And that they would find meaning. That it's not a useless time. Secondly, Lord, uh, there's a lot of people that are watching today that have damage in their souls in their minds, in their hearts, and in their bodies. We realize that what you did on the way to the cross can buy us healing. So Lord, I pray that they would not just focus on a supernatural completion, but they would just focus on the fact that the possibility is there that the salve will hit the wound, that the, there will be a knitting together of the wound. There will eventually be a supernatural 100% healing of that wound whether it be physical, spiritual, or emotional. So, Lord, bring your healing on them now. In Jesus' amazing, powerful, healing name, amen. So, beloved, that was short. But the Lord needed you to have that today. So, commit your suffering to him. Trust him. There'll be meaning there. Identify those wounds and realize the horrible thing that he went through. He did so that you could get a healing. I pray for a people that walk with meaning and suffering and healing because of the stripes of Jesus. God bless you. We'll see you next week.